And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. So that's our title this morning. As you can see, this is a very simple message today. But I think, you know, I was thinking this morning, if it would be my last message, I would want a message like this to be given to you. I'm not saying that I'm leaving next week for good. But if, if I would leave, that would be a good message to, to leave to all of you because that's the key of our faith. That's the goal. That's the center thing of our uh, Christian life. Do you love me? We know the context of that text. You know, the ability to love is a gift from God. God give it to all human beings. Because go back in time when God created the world, he created the world, but the world was not complete until he created male and female to his image and to his likeness. And why did he do it? Because of relationship, because of love. We know that he is merciful, that he is compassionate. God wants us to know about his love. So he has planted the ability to respond to his love, to receive his love, to understand his love, to communicate his love in the human nature of man. <clears throat> but too often, and we see it in, the, in our society, people set their affections on things that are not worthy of such a gift that God has given us. It's such a beautiful gift, a gift of love. It's so pure. It's so perfect. It's the, it's the greatest things that exist in this world. It's the most beautiful things. Love. Loving people, loving nature, loving uh, the things that God has given to us, being grateful and things. This is the most beautiful gift that you have. So today, I would like to reflect upon our love for Jesus, because that's so important. This question was asked from the Lord Jesus to the Apostle Peter in a very crucial moment. You know, it's often in times of crisis that we can respond to a question like that, or that we can think more deeply into the meaning and the importance of that, uh, of, of that questions. We want to know about this. It's the more important question to ask anybody. If you want to ask a question to any Christian around you, anybody, just ask that question. If you want to evangelize, you go somewhere, you want to start a conversation, ask that question. Oh, you will have all sorts of uh, reactions and probably a very good conversation that will follow. You go to a park, you meet someone, says, do you love Jesus? You will find out everything about what that person thinks about Jesus, about life, about death, about eternity very quickly. You know, every reasonable Christian that b claim to believe in the Bible should consider that question very seriously. Don't you think so? That is a very reasonable thing to do. There's a reason why uh, Jesus approached Peter. You know, the Bible is so wonderful because God does not hide the imperfections of his servants. You see it in the Old Testament. <clears throat> you see it in the New Testament. Moses could not enter the promised land. David was chastised by God. The sin of, of his, the servant of God have not been hidden. But God's mercy has always been there to restore them, forgive sins, and give them a, a change. But, so every reasonable Christian should uh, ask themselves that question or consider that question very, very uh, is so important. Your salvation depends upon that. Your salvation, my salvation depends upon this, this question. Actually, the, the quality of your life, now and on earth, the contentment, the joy, you know, it depends on you. It, it, everything that, that goes into your heart, everything that happens to you, the good and the bad, is related to that question here. Or should lead you to, to that question. God asked the simple question to, to us this morning. We know that going to church... Knowing doctrines, it's important for our life. You agree with this? It's, it is part of it, being a Christian. But if we do not have, if something is missing in our lives, you know, we can be obedient. We can serve God in the church. We can do a lot of things. We can know a lot of things in the Bible. 
we can be obedient on a lot of uh, Bible commands and things in the Bible. But if the love for the Savior is missing, the picture of the Christian is not complete. You can have everything else, but if this is missing, something important is missing. You know, Jesus, uh, not Jesus, but the Apostle Paul said this in this way. No, not all who are born into the nation of Israel are truly members of God's people. Not everybody who is connected to a church, not everybody who has been born in a Christian family is members of the true kingdom of God, of the family of God. The same thing is true. We are very familiar with the expression believing in Christ. Uh, you know, through faith in Christ, we have been saved. So this is very clear to us. But I want to say something that not believing in Christ or not loving Christ is very similar. Not believing in Christ, we know you don't get saved. Not loving Christ puts you in a similar uh, state of danger concerning your eternal salvation. Because faith in Christ and loving Christ are interconnected as we will see this morning. The Apostle Paul puts it in this way. Uh, and slide number two. If anyone does not love the Lord, let him be condemned. May our Lord comes. And the word condemned here is a word uh, anathema, like uh, curse or rejected or something. If anyone does not love the Lord, let them be sent away, separated or something like this. You may lack many, many things in your Christian life. You may make many mistakes in your life. There's hope for forgiveness. There's hope for restoration. But if you don't have love for Jesus, you are seriously in danger because you are on the road to eternal destructions. Next, click. The Paul to the Ephesians says, May God's grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with undying love. You know, when Paul wrote this text to the Ephesian Christians there, he didn't know all of them. He didn't know all of their lives. He didn't know their doubts, their fears, if they have sin or not, or whatever it is. But he chose an expression to describe all the Christians with the same terminology. Those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with undying love. That should describe you and that should describe me this morning. Those who love Jesus Christ with undying love. Uh, some Bible study will be, some Bible version will be sincerity. And the, the, the word for that is without corruption. A, a love that will not decay. A love that will not get corrupted. A, Lord, Lord, uh, a love that will not go bad. That will not vanish. It's, that's why we use undying love. A love that will not be changing. A love that circumstances will not change. Crisis will not change. Uh, people will not change. Anything that will happen in our life, there's this love for Christ is going to, to last. May God's grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with this kind of uncorrupted love. It is so important. Our Lord Jesus Christ said to the Jews who were opposing him in the next click, If God were your father, you would love me because I have come to you from God. And in this, we have a very important uh, principle that is true for the Jewish people. It's true for Christians also. If you don't love Jesus Christ, you cannot claim to be a son of the Father. You need both together. You cannot be a child of God if you don't love the Son of God. You cannot call God your Father because if you call God, call, God, call God your Father, it's because you have known the Son that He has sent to save you and that has allowed you to have this relationship with the Father. If you don't have that, you don't have anything. No love for Christ, no sonship of God. It is... Slide number three. There are different degree of loving, of loving God and loving Jesus. And I think we are very familiar with this text in Matthew chapter 22. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God. How should you love him? You know, with all, with everything. Not a little bit, not sometimes, not little. This, this is the highest degree. That's why I'm saying there's, there are different degrees 
through with with which we we love Jesus that we express love for Jesus that we feel for Jesus different degrees at different stage in our lives different people different ways but the greatest commandment says it's with all everything that is within me everything that is within you all of your strength all of the thing it is in your mind with all of your planning with all of your industries with all of your relationship with all of your goals with all of your dreams with all of your strength with your energy when you go to sleep at night when you wake up in the morning you love jesus with all with your possessions and everything so there's no half measure for god to measure our, our love uh, to, to him. So that's the highest. It involves everything. It involves who we are, wh where we're going, you know, whatever we do, or decision of everything. There also, loving Jesus also involves, uh, uh, bring is often brought in the context of comparing something with something else, like uh, choosing something more than others. And we see it in the next verse. No one can serve two masters. Because you will love one more, and you will hate the other one. You cannot love both equally. It doesn't work. It seems that the work, the heart, is not working like that. You focus on this one, you forget that one. That's why adultery doesn't work in a, in a marriage. That's why, you know, a lot of business transaction would not work. Unfaithfulness, lying, cheating, trying this or that, it doesn't, it doesn't work. We need to wa walk with integrity and honesty and things. You cannot love this way and that way. You cannot go east and west at the same time. You will get an accident. You will hit your, your head somewhere. So, Loving Jesus should be more than other things. And here in this context, it's about money, mammon, the, 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 the God of this world that is so attractive that we need so much and everything. You love Jesus more than that. You must love. It doesn't say that you should not love money. It doesn't say that, that, that money is bad. It just says it's a worldly, it's a temporary value, it's something that is not to be our master, to be used for the, the purpose of God. So if you love Jesus more than money, you will use money correctly. Do you understand? That, that's, that's a very easy. But if you let money take over, become your treasure of your heart, then you will have a big, big problem here. So loving Jesus more means separating things deciding what's more important and has more value. It means that you evaluate what's most is your treasure in your life, what's more important. Uh, a, a husband may decide that his wife has more value, should uh, value his wife more than the wife of the neighbor, you know, these kind of things. So the, the Ten Commandments tells us we should value uh, and be content and grateful for our possessions and not covet and not be jealous and fierce for the neighbor's things. So it, that's the same category. You love Jesus more, you, you focus on what you love. Focus Jesus. You know, many times I tell my wife that I love her, and she often remind me, you love Jesus more. <laughs> I said, yes, 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 dear, yes, 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 okay. Right. So we, we, we evaluate, we separate, and we decide. Matthew 10, 37. Again, a, another evaluation of things. If you love your parents more than you love me, and we love our parents. Jesus doesn't tell us, and another text it says hate, but it's not really hate. It's, it's the comparison, it's the more that is important. Do you love your parents more than you love Jesus? So you will disobey Jesus? You will not follow the will of Jesus. You will not answer the call of Jesus. You will not let go of something for Jesus because of your parents. Then something is wrong in the relationship. That's what it means. Jesus should come first. And you can talk to... You know, many parents are... Many, many Christians are paralyzed by their parents. Especially in Chinese traditions or Asian tradition also. I think in the Philippines also. There's a deep respect for family traditions, which is really good. 
better than in the Western world, because in the Western world there's a lack of that. It's, it's, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sickness there. But in the, the Eastern uh, and African also, I think there's a very deep respect for family values. But there's a, uh, there's, there's a danger with that. There's a danger. You are responsible. When you will come before Jesus, you will account for your own faith, for your own obedience, for your own relationship. You will not be able to say, oh, well, but my dad didn't want me to do it, Lord. It, it, it's not going to, to, it doesn't really make sense. If, pu put your decision just at the entrance of the gate of heaven. And you will see what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Oh, Lord, I couldn't really obey you because my dad didn't like it. My dad didn't want me to be a missionary because there was no money involved. And I could not send money to my family. <laughs> you know, this kind of thing. It doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. So if you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you love your son and daughter, wow, parents, you love your children. And many of you are proving it in a very difficult way. You have separate yourself from your family because you think that you are here to improve their livelihood and their future or something like that. You know, one time I was, uh, in my early years when I came here to, to, to Hong Kong, I was in the crisis. I had my daughter who was rebellious. And uh, I had been here already a year and a half. We visited back to Canada. And I, uh, my heart was broken. I just had a big fight with my daughter because she was so disobedient, you know, and we had so many problems with her. I was discouraged, almost ready to quit ministry. And uh, I, many of you have heard that, that story before. And I was going to preach a week of revival meeting in a church with a, a, a pastor friend of mine. And I was driving there with tears in my eyes. I was so defeated, you know, I was so defeated. I did, what am I going to preach to them? I cannot even run my own family. I was really broken. I didn't know what to do. So during that week, I went away to, to uh, fast and pray. Like I would preach in the evening, but during the, the day I had nothing to do, so I was going to, to walk in the forest and pray and fast. And one day, this verse came very strongly from the Holy Spirit into my heart. Because my big question is, uh, is my daughter rebellious because I moved the family from Canada to Hong Kong? And it would be because of my decisions that she is, you know, like that. Should I stay to, in Canada and not go back? to continue missionary work. Like I was confused. I didn't know what to do. And God came through that day in fasting and prayer and told me, look at Abraham. He took his son on the mountain. Bring your children on the mountain and let me take care of them. That's the first day. The second day, that was the, if you love your daughter more than me, you are not worthy of me. And that has spoken so loudly, so deeply to my heart. I felt a strong confidence. I immediately called Bridget because she was in our hometown. I said, I know that God is calling us to have the confidence to go back to, to Asia. You know, without this revelation of God, I would not be here today. Imagine. You know, I needed a strong word from the Lord. Where is my devotion? Where is my affection? I love my daughter. I was crying for her. I was, I was even considering to stop, you know, the ministry, you know, for if, if it was what it needed. But the Holy Spirit quickened into that scripture so, so strongly. Go on the mountain. Bring your children with you and let me handle the children. Yesterday it was my daughter's birthday. She's so loving. She's so sweet. She loves us so much, and we are so, so close to, to her, and it, it's so wonderful. But we had to obey the Lord. Do you love someone, something more than you love the Lord? Do you allow something wrong in your heart and your life to come before, the, before you and the Lord? And in loving Jesus, there's also another dimension we should not uh, forget. There's often a, a notion or an idea of losing. In order to love Jesus more, sometimes you will have to lose something. And it's hard to lose. Change are difficult. Losing is very difficult. 
So are you ready to let go, losing, or it seems that you are losing? And that, that's, that's the trick. That's the trick. That's the test of faith. At first, you are losing. You are losing someone you think you love. Okay, for example, you, have, you are infatuated with someone, but that's not a healthy relationship, but your emotions are so captive that you are ready to disobey the Lord and love that person no matter what. Many, many young people do these uh, foolish uh, decisions, and they will regret it for the rest of their life. So are you ready to have a broken heart, let go of something that you are very attached to, engaged to, in order to understand that you are loving Jesus more? Are you ready to do these kind of things? Or even losing money. Who likes to lose money here in this room? Raise your hand. I don't see any hand, okay? So it's clear. We don't want to lose money, but are you able to choose to, it seems, losing money now because you choose Jesus? I promise you, and I tell you by experience for many years in the ministry, if you lose money for Jesus' sake, you are not loser. You are not losing. You are winning. That money is going to come overflowing with the other ways. With, with peace of mind. Sometimes money doesn't come to you always and money. You give money, you receive money. Sometimes you receive something of much more value than money. You can receive peace at home. You can receive love in your relationship. You can receive a, a lot of good things. A respect on your reputation. You can receive a, the, something of much more value than the equivalent of money. You lose $1,000. So what if you, if you receive so much more benefit and, and quality of life and relationship and love and everything? It's much more value. Please say amen to that. Amen. That is so true. That is so true. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's go to the next slide. After Jesus rose from the dead, three times he asked that question. Not one time. Three times. And you know... Peter felt so sad the third time. Why three times? And you, you know, why, why Jesus did not ask Peter, are you ready to believe now, Peter? Because that's a lack of faith that he had. He did not believe. He denied Jesus. He ran away. I don't know this man, you know. Are you ready to believe? That's not the question Jesus asked. Are you converted now, really, Peter? That's not the question he asked. Are you ready to confess me before you denied me, Peter? No, that's not the question. Peter, are you willing to obey me now? That's not the question. What is the question? Do you love me? It's not, are you willing this? Are you going that? La, la, la. No, only one question. And the third time, Peter felt very, very sad. He didn't use any of the other questions. You know why, I think? Because Jesus wanted a fresh confession of faith from Peter's heart before he was going to restore him to his ministry, to his calling. What was the goal of Jesus with Peter? It's not only to restore him, but it's the future of what was going to happen. Remember when Jesus met Peter for the first time? Your name is Simon. Now I'm going to call you rock, solid rock, leader rock. Your name was dead, no, not for me, because I see your potential. I see the future. I see the plan that I have for you. But he failed. So Jesus says, the best question, do you love me? That is the most important question. If you answer that question correctly, all the other things, will you obey me, is answered. Are you converted? It's answered. You know, all of these questions will be, will be answered. So that's very important. So the point here is that he wants us to know that all of Christianity centers upon this one simple question. Do you love me? So what do we say this morning? Do we love Jesus? It seems so simple, isn't it? Simple question. But it's so deep. And it goes so deep in our heart. Anybody can understand that kind of uh, language. Educated, no schooling. A child can understand that. Uh, people advance and degrees and all kinds, rich or poor. If a person loves Jesus Christ, 
everything is right. If he doesn't like Jesus, everything is wrong. Okay, so that's very clear. What is the secret of this special emotion for the Lord? I, I, you hear me talk about this question and I'm sure like, do I really love Jesus? Do I love Jesus enough? What, what, what's my love for Jesus? Do you have this question right now in your heart? You know, I think, I think you do, you know. Where does that special emotion come from? If you look at the slide number five, you will see the answer. We love because he loved us first. Some of the Bible <coughs> translation says, we love God because he loved us first. But some Bible translation leave God out because it says we love. The ability to love God and our brothers and sisters is coming out of loving uh, Jesus. So why should we love Jesus Christ? How, where does that come from? How can we be motivated? Uh, where do we find that emotion? When you look at all of these things you listed on this list here, think about what Jesus has done for you. He suffered in my place. He died for me on the cross. He redeemed me from guilt. He redeemed me from the power of sin and the eternal consequence of sin. He forgave all of my sins. He freed me from my captivity and from my addiction. I was addicted. Maybe you had problems with different captivity, bad habits or, you know, bad way of thinking that you, you inherited. You, he took us from, away from the way to hell and placed us in the narrow path that leads us to eternal life. He has given us light instead of a life of darkness, peace of mind, hope instead of fear, stress, and uncertainty. So can you love Jesus with this kind of background? Let me, let me put it in another way. We love Jesus not only for what he has done, but we love Jesus also for what he is doing. Is he doing something? Where is Jesus right now in relation to you? He's in heaven. He is your mediator. He's working for you. He's thinking of you. He's praying for you. He's interceding for you. He's not. He, that's why the Bible says he never will leave you nor forsake you. He is engaged. He is totally given. He is married to you. He is, he is faithful to you. So that's what he is doing. He is part of our life. He intercedes for us. He equips us. He guides us. He helps us in times of needs. He's preparing an eternal home for us. I love the verse. I don't have it in my text here, but you will recognize it. Galatians 2.20. It is no longer I who lives. That's a declaration of love. Just, just that, that's a big declaration of God, of love to God. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. So, and pay attention to that declaration. So the life I now live, so the way that I choose to live my life now, so what runs my life, what's the drive and the motivation of my life, the reason why I live in this way, the life that I now live, I live by faith, or, the different translation, I live by the faithfulness of God who loved us and gave himself for me. Again, that relationship. He loved me, he gave himself for me, he is faithful to me, so the life that I now live, it's no longer me, it's not about me, it's him who lives in me, I love him, I, I want to l follow him and all of this. So the, the, this love of God is what impact our faith, it, it works together, this direct impact on our relationship, the way we choose to live, the purpose of our lives. Let me ask you a few questions, very basic. If you would end up in jail because you have bankrupt and you didn't pay your debts, and then a friend unexpectedly would come, pay your debts, get you a job as a partner in his company, would you love him? Yes. yes. If you would be a prisoner of war and a friend who is a soldier at the risk of his own life breaks through enemy lines and rescue you, would you be grateful? Would you love that person? Yes. yes. Would a seaman who would fall overboard in a storm love the man who dives into the sea and by his efforts save him from death? Would you love that person? Yes. 
You only yes, no, yes. <laughs> Not more than that. You, you know I'm, I'm, I'm forcing you to say yes with all these questions, you know. But that makes so sense. A child can answer a question like that. Is that true? If you ask this question to a child, you will say yes, 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 okay? So be like a child and say yes to me. <laughs> Praise God. So why is loving Christ so important? First of all, because it proves that you have already what we call, um, uh, what we call saving faith. You know, the devil believes. Do you know that? Yeah. Satan has faith. He believes God. Maybe, not maybe, much more than you do. He believes God exists. He believes in God. He believes in Jesus. Because when demons would meet Jesus, he says, Son of God, have you come here to torture us? Like, who are you? Like, uh, have you come before the time? They know Jesus is, the demons. They, they, they know Jesus exists. But do they love Jesus? No, they don't love. So, if you are truly saved... You have to have that kind of love. Otherwise, you must ask some, some question. If you have saving faith, you should have this love for Jesus. Where there is real justifying faith in Christ, there will always be a heart. Look at the slide number six. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Is that true? Okay. Every human being, we are forgiven much. Do you agree with that? Yes. But our understanding and our appreciation of that is not the same. So some say take for granted. Religious people, it's not like, like I used to, to grow up in Catholic Church and we were told since childhood that Jesus was the savior of the world. Yeah. Great. So what? You know, it's the savior of the world. But it's only when I was 25 years old and the Holy Spirit came on me so strongly to reveal me that he was my savior. Oh, that doesn't mean the same thing. I knew he was the savior of the world, but it didn't affect me. But when he became my savior, it affected me. And when I remember that day when I was watching a movie about uh, the return of Jesus on earth, a prophetic movie, and the voice of the commentator in the movie, there's a big voice was commenting on everything. There was like uh, uh, natural disasters and uh, uh, storms and typhoon and, and tsunamis and fires and whatever. And it says, and this God who created this world is the one who is coming to judge sinners. And when I heard that, <laughs> He's coming for me. <laughs> wow, that, that is. So for me, I, I, I got the point on that day that I was a sinner and I was saved by grace by a loving God. So I became totally sold out for Jesus from day number one of my conversion. If a man has no love for Christ, he may be sure that he has no faith. Because you don't have this understanding. This woman loved so much because she was such a bad sinner and she has received such great forgiveness. So she, she knew it, she was aware of it, so she responded to it very clearly. So maybe sometimes for people who do not um, feel that such a love for Jesus Christ Christians, maybe it's because they have forgotten. It's like in a marriage relationship, Christian life, Christian walk with Jesus is like marriage. You fall in love, you're crazy with one another. After a few years of marriage, everything becomes for granted. And the relationship becomes cold, you know, things like that. And we don't really think about little, little things like that, you know. We just, you know, whatever. So it's the same with God. So, and I, I was reading a text, I wrote it somewhere uh, today. I think in Second Peter 1, 9. The one who lacked these qualities, like all of these qualities of the Christian life and actions, is blind. He has forgotten the cleansing of his past sins. He forgot what God has done. He forgot in what kind of mess he was. He forgot that he was eternally lost. He forgot what Jesus has done for our life. And when we forget, 
And we are so used to go to church, be doing the Christian life and Christian things and singing, praising and whatever it is that we do every day. And when we forget that aspect of this deep relationship of what Christ has done for us, it's easy to lose our first love. You agree? Yeah. Okay. Praise God. <coughs> At least we agree on something. <laughs> Praise God. And you see the other text that also says the same thing. We look at this text. No one can serve two masters. Love, hate, despise, devotion. It's one or the other, one on the other. So, so it's very important. Love for Christ is the driving force of working for Christ. Without love for Christ, there's no missionary that will last on the mission field. There's no pastors that will last in the, in the, in the ministry. Without love for Christ, it, it, will not, it will not work. Maybe there will be religion practices. There will be social life seen. There would be some uh, form of Christianity done. But not the, the devotion, the deep devotion. Excitement may stir up new Christians to get involved for a while, but without perseverance. I know many missionaries that came to Hong Kong through the years. I've been here 26, going on 27 years. We have seen a lot of young missionaries coming here. They're not here anymore. They all left. And some of them, they made big promise, I'm here for life. Whoop, where are they? <laughs> they are not here anymore. Oh, they are not. People easily lose interest and if they are not motivated by the love of Christ. That's, the love of Christ heals the heart. It, it, it heals the hurt. You know, when, when there's jealousy and tensions among Christians and a relationship in the church, everything, the love for Christ is the only cure. Because, you know, sometimes he talks against me and he doesn't like me and la la la, la, la and he owes me money and la, whatever problem it is. The love of Christ heals everything in the relationship. Without it, we're in big, big problem. There's a big difference between a nurse and a wife by the sick bed of a loving husband. If it's a nurse, she will do her duty. If it's a loving wife, she will care and she will panic and she will have feeling for the sick husband. There's a difference between a nurse and a mother with a, a child dying of cancer on the side of the bed. The nurse will give the, the proper care, but the wife will cry over, over the, her, her child. So think about this. The love of Christ and the faith toward Christ. Slide number seven. If anyone love me, keep my word. They will keep my word. So that's another little test. Where is it? Where is the word in our lives? Where is the place of the word? It's so clear. Is this a text clearer than this? If anyone, anyone, are you here anyone? Is there anyone here in this room? Okay. Anyone who loves me, what will they do? They will keep my word. Where is the word? How do we keep the word? Where do we take it from? How do we learn the word? How do we abide in the word? It's, it's, it's part of the, that old thing. And we will, I will explain a little bit on, more on that. What will be the result of that? The Father will love me or him and we father and I will come and we will make our home and that person and we will be with the with the relationship over there and the opposite is true also if anyone does not love me he will not keep my word so where do you that's a good test this morning how is love for Christ manifest? How can we recognize the, the same tomes or the proofs of, that we love Christ? Just think in terms of human love. That already will be very clear. Go to the next slide. When we love someone, what happens? We think often about that person. Even if that person is away in another country, Nobody needs to tell you, hey, remind, remember this one. If you love that person, nobody has to tell you to remember. They are there in your heart. They are there in your mind. You, you think of them always. Those of you who are separated from your children, do you think of your children? Do you need someone to remind you to think about your children? Nobody has to do that. Okay. That would be a bad sign. 
That would be a bad sign. So the same thing with Christian. You know, affection and memory, do you know it works together? If you love someone, the memory of that person is vivid. It's, it's right there. Amen. Hallelujah. When we love someone, we like to hear messages. You know, parents who have children living abroad like we do, we Skype. We love to see their face on Skype. We like to receive an email or a Facebook Messenger, a WhatsApp text, like an exchange. We, we like it. It brings pleasure. We, we take these messages and these moments like we treasure these things. Same thing with the Word of God. When we love someone, we like to please that person. How many mothers would deny themselves to please their child? They would not eat the last fruit. So that the child can have it, you know? Like they do all sorts of things. They, 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 you, you will go to the restaurant, not of your choice, but the restaurant of your, of your child. You know, like this kind of things. You do a lot of things just to sh please the love, the, the one that you love. W shouldn't it be with Jesus? Wouldn't it be able to sacrifice something? Because you love Jesus more. It comes back to the same thing, loving more. Like responding to his calling, do something, letting go something, or whatever it is that, that would cost us something to follow Jesus. Peter says, we love, uh, uh, Jesus, we, we left everything for you. What will happen of us? And Jesus says, I don't worry, you're not losing with me. You will get 100 more. You know? That is something. You know, when I came here at first, I remember one thing, that verse. You will receive 100 times more. We sold our house. We gave our cars. We, we, did, we, uh, we have nothing in Canada, no property. But every time we go, we have nice house. We have nice cars. We, we, we live with good people that takes care of us. So 100 times. I, so I still have many, many more houses to visit because I haven't visited 100 houses yet. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. When we love someone, we are protective of their honor and reputation. Okay. Uh, we, we, you know, I was reading of a pastor in Nepal who the government is very anti-Christian. They cannot do this, they cannot do that. So they have to do representation to the government. They have to write to the government. They have to go to meet with the government, the president of the country, and defend the rights of the Christian. The Buddhists and the uh, Sri Lanka, the same thing. They are very, very uh, persecuted. So, so we have people who must do that to defend the rights, to speak up for, to, 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 to do things in the name of Christ, to defend the authority and their country. When we love someone, we like to talk with them. Christians should love to talk to Jesus every day, spend time in prayer, speaking, seeking his leading, looking for wisdom, uh, things like that. When we love someone with whom we are separated, very far away, we are just thinking, oh, they are coming in two weeks, or they are coming in six months, oh, at the summer break, they will come and visit us. So you, you already uh, hope for, expect this time, looking forward to this time of, of reun being reunited again. What about Jesus? We're going to be reunited with Jesus someday. We sang it uh, when we all go to heaven this morning. That's a wonderful song. I really liked it. When we love someone, you love him even though you have never seen him. Have you seen Jesus? No? Maybe you've seen him in a vision or in a movie. But that's, in a movie, that's not the real Jesus. You know that, huh? Okay. <laughs> though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious and inexpressible joy. And the context of that verse is like your thinking, your salvation is assured. Eternity is open to you. Uh, your faith is being stored in heaven. You're going there. You are inheriting. So, so all of this joy, the glorious uh, feeling is wonderful. Amen? Amen? So can I ask you the question in closing this morning? Can you honestly say that you love Christ? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. I hope that we can all say that. The first application to that question has to do with our eternity, as we mentioned before. If you and I do not love Christ, our eternity will be in great danger. We understand that. Someone who do not live love Christ and this life is unfit for heaven and the life to come. 
it, 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 does, does it make sense? You don't love Christ in this life. Are you going to love him in the life to come? No, you, we need to. So it's, it's a danger. The second application is that he that lives without the love of Christ feels no obligation for Christ. There's no need to sacrifice, no need to serve, no need to get involved, there's nothing to do. There's no motivation, there's no obligation, there's no sense of duty, there's no sense of obedience. It's just like indifference or some sorts of things like that. If you are lacking love for Christ, probably the reason is what we mentioned. You have no sense of debt toward him. Like you have lost that sense of something. Or maybe you have never had it in your life to begin with. You have no feeling of obligation to him. You have no recollections of having received anything from him that is really so important or life-changing, so the affection for Christ is not there, not like it should be. The, to see your need of Christ and to recognize the amazing depth that we have toward Christ is the first step toward loving Jesus. Agree? Amen.